All right. Well, I mean, I think I've answered. Um, well, let me go back a little bit on the proportionality point. I think. Uh, there are a number of possible explanations for why proportionality matters. You know, one explanation would be that uh, if the military follows proportionality guidelines, um, they might uh, be worried at the end of a war about what they might be held accountable for. Some people argue that this actually helps explain why the Nazis decided or did not ultimately blow up Paris because they had plans to do so. I'm not sure how sound that case is, but the fun part of it is I'm not sure. And there are movies made about this and, you know, it, it could be they just were uh, you know, kind of incompetent and in carrying things out. But it also sounds when you read more and more, there was a certain uh, sympathy for uh, the way the place looked, the, the food, <laughs> didn't really want to flatten it. And then there was concern that they might be held in international criminal court if they did. That last point's worth dwelling on. I'm not sure you're ever going to get a good answer with regard to the Paris example, but it's worth thinking about and reviewing the, you know, kind of like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, should we have done it? I, I think, uh, you know, whatever your opinion is, it's worth thinking about the opposite as well. So, you know, so that's one reason. I think, you know, obviously, uh, it, it, the Second World War was just this massively uh, grotesque, killing, grinding, flesh-eating machine. It was a very, very nasty war. Extremely nasty. And I, I think we, we barely grasp how bad it was. Um, and when you read detailed accounts, it's always shocking. I don't care how much of it you've read. If you read more of it, it gets more shocking. Proportionality was an international legal effort to push back on some of the, the hoariness of all that. I'm not sure it's wrong. I'm not sure how much when you get going in a war, that'll help. But I'm not sure, and I don't think anyone who is sure should be listened to for very long. A little humility. I think it could help, and we need to leave that as a possibility. But all of those uh, explanations, I think, are speculative. I'll give you one that isn't. I had the opportunity to run I believe I was told the first war game where the opponent was a smaller country that used nuclear weapons against us. This is like, I don't know, 35 years ago. <laughs> That's a long time. 30 years ago. It's not as bad as I thought. 30 years ago. After the game, it was held uh, at the, uh, the Marine compound. Uh, here in Virginia. What is the name of that? Help me. Somebody knows. So, Say again. Do you mean Quantico? Quantico here in Virginia? The one that's just down the road here. They have the uh, Marine University. Well, you can tell I can't even remember where it was. In any case, I do remember the general. His name was General Boomer. I'm not making that up. He had command of the Marines in the uh, first uh, war with Iraq. And he had, was decorated and he'd served in Vietnam. He'd seen action. And he called me after the game. He said, well, why don't we get some drinks? I said, fine. And we were talking, just the two of us. And I asked him, I said, well, what? I've always wanted to know what this word strategy was about. I said, it, it, the etymology is what generals talk about. I've never been alone with a general to ask them what the heck they talk about when they're alone with one another. I said, if you take out discussions of golf, football, sports, prospective divorces, and you know, hot automobiles or whatever it is, what do you guys talk about? He had an answer. 
and it, dwell, it, it, it bears on this. He said, well, you know, there are really only two requirements for good generalship. Okay. I said, what are they? He said, the first is you somehow have to get perfectly civilized human beings who have followed the law for the most part. You have to give them a gun and you have to get them to murder someone they don't even know. He said, that is difficult. He said, but then the harder thing comes after they, they get they get to that, you have to get over that threshold. Said, What's that? He said, well, 10 to 20% of them are going to get a taste for killing. And you have to go to the front, not to lead, but to pull these people off in front of the others so that they see that this is inappropriate. I said, why? He said, well, you know, when they have heads in jars or, you know, ears laced around their, their neck, it, it brings, it makes people crazy and it in, condones craziness and it makes it impossible to have good discipline and order. And he said, if you don't have that, you lose. I don't care what your advantages are. So proportionality is what you use as a guide to prevent that. And it is actually in the national security interest of a military unit to get into that. I don't think people think of it that way. Maybe they should. All right. Having dwelled on that, now we can address how things have changed the last 20 years. This will be so familiar, we can go through this pretty quickly. Uh, I think I've shown this picture before. This is uh, the bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, not much less. Uh, the bombings were massive, indiscriminate affairs. Uh, you know, in the beginning, in 42, as I explained, half of the bombs didn't even fall within 75 square miles of the intended point target. So you were reduced to destroying everything to destroy what you wanted to destroy. That was 45. Let's go to the next slide. I've jumped. Uh, I think if memory serves me, and I'll check, when the additional protocol, which we'll talk about, which says you shouldn't uh, hit reactors unless certain conditions are met, it was drafted in 77, which is roughly a Vietnam period, a little later. Um, I think we got within a quarter mile. Our CEP was like a quarter of a mile. And it, it probably colored or shaped how they thought and talked about proportionality and targeting then. Here's where we are now. The ability to target with effectively zero CEP and no explosive yield. Uh, in this case, the driver uh, opened the door and walked out. Uh, person in the rear seat, no, didn't make it. Now, that has consequences. When you move from not being able to hit what you want and therefore having to hit everything, including a lot of stuff maybe you, maybe you shouldn't want to hit. I mean, I'm not so sure we didn't care enough about the people who lived in Nagasaki, my guess is, you know, that it killed a lot of people for a lot of people was a good thing, you know, but we didn't have any choice. So, you know, the ethics of judging those people, a little bit differing. Um, okay. Um, let's go to the next slide. We're on the hook, so to speak. And it isn't just us, the Chinese, the Israelis, the Iranians, uh, the North Koreans, the Indians, the Pakistanis, all God's children have accurate missiles, whether they're, you know, cruise missiles or, or uh, ballistic missiles. The, the CEPs are now measured in tens of meters, you know, 50, 100 meters the most. Uh, things are getting more accurate. All right. Now, it's kind of interesting how this happened. It, it had to do with American 
technology associated with the uh, Pershing II, which was the most advanced weapon we had in our arsenal in the 80s, uh, finding its way in the Middle East uh, and winding its way to China. And then from there, well, you know how the story goes. Anyway, American technology is uh, benefiting a lot of folks we're now facing and in ways that are not friendly. <laughs> All right, let it go to the next uh, slide. Well, I mean, this is perhaps hyperbole, but uh, you know, the blast area is um, bigger than the CEP, and that's with a non-nuclear warhead. And in some cases, with almost no warhead at all. Okay, next slide. This was, I believe, a dramatization of the accuracy of the Korean missile, which is based on a Russian missile, which is the same missile roughly that the North Koreans have. Um, then we have the drones, and these are becoming manufactured all sorts of places. My favorite is the Amazon drone, which uh, you can buy. Uh, it carries, it looks like 20 to 30 pounds. Uh, can go 60 miles an hour and can fly, you know, a few miles. That is enough to ruin someone's afternoon. Um, and who would know who launched it? Hmm. We're living in a very different world than we were even 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Mr. Sikulski? Yeah. So the the key variable with the drones, or the, I guess the key two variables, are uh, anonymity. It's harder to figure out what's going on. But then also, is it like detectability? They're harder to see on radar. Well, that too. They can fly lower. That too. Now, but we have, I'm, I'm going to be really sarcastic, so brace yourself. Do you know what you're supposed to do if you operate a reactor and you see one fly near you or over you? No. Call the FAA. Then they're supposed to call the Defense Department. We, let's just say that's not a complete thought. <laughs> You know, it, it, it may make legal and bureaucratic sense, but in, in the real world, that ain't going to help a whole lot. That's where we're at. Heads up, no pun intended. All right. Did that answer your question? It did. Cool. All right. Ab cake. I don't know how you know that that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, but I'm told that's how you pronounce it, ab cake. Um, this wasn't too long ago, it was five years ago. Non-state actors penetrated three layers of advanced defenses, knocking out 5% of the world's oil capacity. Now you'll see those holes in, in red. The Israeli intelligence uh, supposedly came to the conclusion that given that they were the exact same location, that it's probable that there was only one meter CEP. And I don't know if, how you do that. But, you know, they say it's not Hebrew, Hebrew, or Greek. Well, this was at least Hebrew. I mean, I don't know how they came to that conclusion, but that's the conclusion they got. Uh, what's more interesting is it got past Patriots, Skyguard, which is a, a German system, and the Cheyenne, which is a French system, never engaged. I think there was an inclination on the part of some of us <laughs> to say, oh, well, it's the Saudis, you know. I mean, they, you know, they don't... <clears throat> They just, yeah, you know, what, what, what do you expect? However, uh, the head of, uh, I think our ambassador to NATO, I believe, uh, pointed out that actually NATO wouldn't have any more luck than the Saudis and that we have a problem. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Oh, but they did not... Uh, they could have followed up with a, a second attack, and they chose not to. 
Had they, it wouldn't have been 5% of the world's oil capacity. It would have been a larger number and it would not have been fixed as quickly. They were sending a message rather than destroying something. Next slide. Okay, what does this mean for targeting reactors? Um, it used to be in the 70s and 80s, and even up until recently with the Syrian reactor, it was a binary. You used a plane and you'd either obliterate the reactor and the building, or, you, or in the case of uh, Saddam shooting a Scud at Debona, just miss it, missed it entirely. Um, it was a binary, uh, kind of like turning a TV on or off. With accuracy, you can play a very different game. You can gradually strangulate the patient and cause them to spew, if you will, deadly disease in the form of radiation at varying levels, depending on what you, how you go about the accurate incremental strangulation. You can hit the uh, incoming wires, which will trip the emergency generator. Um, you can hit the emergency generator causing, you know, a loss of coolant accident. You could hit the control room. And if there isn't a remote one, maybe you can do the same. You could hit the steam generator pipes if they're exposed that then would cause, you know, a coolant issue and radiation if it, depending on the reactor type, if it was a boiling water reactor, well, there you go. It'd be radioactive water, steam coming out. Now, my favorite, well, oh, the, 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 the king and queen of uh, massive knock-on effects would be hitting a spent fuel storage pond. Now, in the case of the Zaporizhia and the, the Russian plants, I believe, of the VVR uh, design. Fortunately, they have the spent fuel pond in the containment building. But that is not the case with regard to a lot of boiling water and even pressurized water reactors. And these buildings are soft. They are not hard. Um, the Congress asked for two studies from the National Research Council, which is a federal body. It's not academic outfit, they put out two reports and they were sounding the alarm that this was really a frightening prospect that we needed to have sprinkler systems, we needed maybe to have passive defenses, you know, bird cages around these things, that we needed to get as much of the spent fuel out of there and put it in dry cast storage, blah, blah. It didn't do anything. Now, my Perhaps the most interesting uh, target is one that a WAG who got this brief pointed out to me. He said, well, it might be that if you just lob a, a missile in the parking lot and get lucky and hit the, the uh, chief operator's automobile, everyone will get a message, shut down the plant, they probably shut down all the other plants, and everybody in the neighborhood would get in their cars and clog the roads up. He said, I hadn't thought of that. I ran that past some targeteers. They thought that was intriguing. So there are a number of different kinds of things you can do. Let, let's go to the next chart that accuracy enables that wasn't even an issue. And this is a, a, an eye chart, but it basically amplifies the point I've been trying to make, which is targeting distinct portions or nodes at the reactor site generate different results. I mean, you hit the parking lot, or the grid connection, it's not like anything is going to happen with regard to the release of radioactivity, but you are going to wig out. You may shut down you know, the nuclear reactor or try to, and others as well. The locals may get restless and clog the roads for a certain number of hours. And if it's operationally an important region, that has consequences. Your military can't go there. Um, if you, uh, uh, strike the control room, the nuclear island, the spent fuel ponds, uh, you have high regional damage, and we'll see maps of that in a moment. Um, and, you know, you can salt the earth. 
you can cause all kinds of problems. So anyway, you can read this chart. It's, it's just a four, well, three by, by two across it. Well, three by three, actually. Um, it's somewhat useful. Okay. Are there any questions about this chart or what I've just argued? Sort of important to understand. Okay. Mush, what's the next slide? All right, well, I was trying to explain. No? Hello? No? I was trying to explain that the history or, or the past isn't necessarily something that repeats. It may rhyme, as, as Mark Twain said. I counted, uh, and you know, the numbers may vary a little, but not much, 13 plausible cases uh, in which reactors have already been hit uh, in the Middle East. Uh, one of them was in Iraq, one of them was in Syria, one of them was in Israel, and one of them was in Iran. They were not hit with accurate missiles. They were hit with uh, airplanes that carried a large, uh, you know, uh, amounts of uh, explosive or an inaccurate scud. None of these plants were operating, with the exception of Demona. The ones that were operating were not large. Therefore, if they were hit and released radiation, it would not be a major release. The ones that were large were not operating. That doesn't apply in the case of Zaporizhia or Ukraine or Kursk or Germany or Japan or India and Pakistan or the Koreas. So let's take a look at what that might entail. You could say, well, there he goes again, he's breathless and put him out in the parking lot with a shopping cart and put tinfoil on his head. Well, okay, but Demona uh, has been threatened um, to be hit. I think the latest raid that we just read about, they aimed a missile which was hit out of the sky at Demona. Um, Hezbollah has threatened uh, to hit it uh, with this uh, missile, uh, Fata 110, these things are, you know, if they get precision kits on the front, who knows, they might be able to hit things. The UAE has been threatened by the Houthis. Uh, you'll notice that the missile there is pretty big. Um, it has not hit these plants. However, as will be explained further in the lecture, the UAE takes this at least seriously enough to have held a week-long radiation reactor fire emergency drill with lots of other countries. So I don't think this should be just dismissed as uh, theoretical. Right. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. Now, this was what got me focused on, on all of this. Um, four years ago, there were verbal threats made uh, to attack an Armenian plant with an Israeli missile that Azerbaijan had. It didn't happen, but it's interesting how public they were making the threat. This precipitated phone calls um, from Putin to Erdogan to help uh, make sure that the Azerbaijanis didn't follow through. That's interesting. That's like international relations. That's not hypothetical. That's almost, it's almost government activity, yeah? All right, so it could change things. Again, nothing happened. Next slide.
Not so in Ukraine. It's very, uh, I think the latest uh, reporting that I read from some prestigious news service and or major sheet, there are only three left, that would be Post, Times, Journal, said, well, you know, no reactor in Ukraine has been hit by Putin. Well, that's not really true. Uh, there have been 100 ballistic hits at a research reactor there at the Kharkiv Institute, and that's in Crimea. There have been overflights, and there have been shells that have, you know, been absorbed at these other facilities listed. More important, Putin is getting smart. He's going after the substations, the transformers that are are feeding electricity to run the safety equipment at these plants. You don't have to just hit the plant to knock out a plant. Take care of the electricity, you can cause problems. There's about 10 days worth of fuel, people say, to run the diesel electrics. After 10 days, you run out. You have some battery power for a few hours. You don't have much. Not easy to bring diesel fuel into a war zone. You know, maybe if it's you know Western Ukraine, it's not a big deal. If you've got enough missiles firing while you're trying to fix this, it could be. Anyway, um, this is sort of a smorgasbord. Now, the Russians uh, have been claiming that the Ukrainians are targeting their plant at Kursk. You know, the Kursk plant is interesting because it's a Chernobyl style RMBK. Remember that part of the lecture where you know, little, no containment building, uh, a uh, negative, uh, is it negative? Well, it has a, a, a reactivity coefficient that's such that it, if it loses coolant, the, it, it speeds up until it explodes. Great. So they're claiming the Ukrainians are, are aiming missiles. Is that a false flag operation? Don't know. Um, do we have some way to independently verify what's going on? Apparently not. That's, that could be a problem for military operations. Okay, next slide. Then we have the Russians <laughs> uh, milking any, you know, they like threatening us with nuclear things because they know we're, we're kind of uh, prone to wring our hands when the N-word's used. So, you know, they did overflights of Bunsbüttel, uh, which is a nuclear plant closed down in Germany. The Germans were apoplectic, did not get covered. But coincidental with that was a plea that the Germans not allow their missiles to be fired in any depth into Russia. Well, this is how they message? Maybe. Hmm, how does that work? Then we have uh, Medvedev, uh, sort of number two, threatening to hit three nuclear plants in Ukraine and others in Eastern Europe if Ukraine attempts to strike Smolensk, which is a Russian reactor, which of course, uh, you'll notice that didn't, there was no follow through because they didn't hit that reactor. Uh, warns NATO nations that accidents can happen in Europe at European nuclear plants too. Well, that's very charming. So, you know, they're trying to leverage the allies to not support Ukraine in certain ways. And this is, this is one of the avenues they use. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. This has military implications. This is not safety. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, well, where else? Um, I remember uh, visiting uh, senior people, including, I guess, the current... Uh, I think he, he may be the defense minister now. He was a national security advisor at the time, small government. And we talked about um, the environmental movement, which is at the root of one of the constituencies that brought in the government 
in 2016 and the current um, president, they want to shut down all of the reactors because they're in a earthquake zone. Now there's certain practicalities about, well, do you have enough electricity to do that? But in any case, uh, an argument I gave them, I said, well, you know, you're gonna have a referendum on this for sure. And they did, they've had more than one, I think, but at least one. I said, you might wanna dial in this other argument. He said, what's that? Well, if you get hit, people are quite a mess if there's a release of radioactivity. He said, oh, I hadn't thought of that. I did a number of studies uh, and I, they were taken on by the, the national auditor for, they have an auditor for public policy, roughly. If you will, a, a, a government accountability office of their own. And it, they published and confirmed that this was a big problem. And it, I don't know how much effect it had, but referendum failed. Uh, they have fire drills radiological fire drills, including the public. Um, they also have, have somebody um, that, that made a rather um, outlandish threat. And that is, well, maybe we need to target mainland China's reactors. I have held meetings, more than a few, several years worth, with Chinese officials, they are very concerned about this, maybe not the Taiwanese, but they're concerned about the vulnerability of their reactors. That may be why um, there were plans drawn um, to possibly target Taiwan's reactors. Great, okay, so no problem there, I don't see any. Oh, uh, South Korea. Are any of you going to play in the game? I think you are, a show of hands. How many hands are up? One, that's good. We got one, we get two. Two, okay, well, start with two. Um, we have others who are not here. In South Korea, you have facilities which six months out of the year will have the radioactivity if it's released blow into South Korea and the other six months into Japan. That has consequences. All right, let's, enough, we're tormenting this. Next slide. You'll be able to play the game. You'll see what the consequences are. You'll tell us, control what you think the you know, consequences are. Well, here's a, a threat that a lot of Japanese don't know. I had to get this in the hands of a number of folks didn't didn't know about this. South Korean gave me this. I don't know Korean. He did. So it says Japan houses as many U.S. nuclear power plants, bases, military facilities. Japan is destined towards an insurmountable calamity, which will dwarf nuclear sufferings that Japan had experienced in the 40s. It's not a very unveiled threat. Or not, not a very veiled threat, excuse me. Well, there you have it. I know that the South Koreans had done a major uh, in-house study financed by Parliament to try to figure out what the vulnerabilities are and what they can do about it. I tried to get certain South Koreans to write about this and they said too sensitive, can't, can't write about it. So apparently it's an issue. Next slide. 